It was a dark and stormy morning. The disciples had been out in the boat for most of the evening and into the morning, and they were now battered by the winds and the waves, and they were thinking, if only Jesus were here, he could get this all to stop. He's done it before. He did it in his sleep the last time this happened. If only he were here, and before the words had even left their mouths, before the thoughts had even left their minds, there off in the distance was a figure. A ghost? No, no. He calls out and says, it is I, it is the rabbi. Oh, great, says Peter, the head of the disciples. Let me come out and join you. Just tell me to come out and I'll do it. You can do it, says Jesus. You don't need my permission. I've already told you you're good enough to be just like me. Don't make me do all the work. Meet me halfway. Come on out here. And Peter, trusting in what the master said, stepped over the edge of the boat and out onto the water. And sure enough, he had it in him to begin walking on the water out to meet Jesus in the middle of the lake. But the winds were still strong and the lightning was crashing and it was frightening out there. There was too much noise and too much static and too much interference. And he wavered. And he doubted. And he started to sink. And Jesus said, do I have to do everything? <laughs> and reaches out his hand once again to Peter, not giving up on him. Jesus, the true universalist, lifting Peter up out of the water and back into the boat again. I told you you could do it. Why did you doubt me? I told you you could do it. Why did you doubt? Rob Bell, my favorite Christian evangelical and a true classic universalist in the Christian sense of the word, tells a story about the relationship between Jesus and his disciples that plays out throughout the Christian scriptures. That Jesus as rabbi in choosing his disciples was telling those 12 men, I already think you are good enough to be just like me, because that's how rabbis chose their students. They chose those who they saw themselves in. And the rest of the story of the relationship between Jesus and his disciples through all the scriptures is one of them constantly forgetting that lesson or doubting it or having a little too much overconfidence in the wrong direction with that message, but always having to come back to that message from Jesus. I already told you you could do it. You are good enough to be like me. The story of Jesus and Peter walking on the water is the prime example of that moment of doubt and having to teach that lesson over and over again. Tell me to come out there and I'll do it. Okay, come out here. I already told you you could do it. And Peter starts the journey, but the wind and the waves and the lightning and the noise are just too much. They are just too fear instilling for Peter to get the message. There's just too much chaos for him to believe what he has been told about himself. And so he starts to sink. I get Peter. I get him. I love Peter. Because he knows in his heart what he's hearing from his teacher, but he doubts it again and again and again. Because there's always some sort of storm crashing in around your head, causing you to fear, causing you to doubt, causing you to want to kind of take half steps or a retreat. I get Peter. Because I hear the storms all the time. My storm comes in the form of the voice of my inner critic. Raise your hand if you've got one of those voices, too, that you listen to. Yep. It's a whisper, but it's a whisper right in your ear, so it sounds loud, and it sounds like a storm. It's the whisper that says, everything you do is wrong. Whenever 
I do a play, if you've come up to talk to me afterwards and you say, uh, really nice show, John, and I just nod and smile at you, it's because the voice of my inner critic is causing that storm into my ear. Your show is terrible and they're just being polite. <laughs> Every time I have a moment of parenting crisis, you're ruining your children and they're going into therapy. <laughs> And every Sunday morning, 5.30, when I get up, you don't have the words. None of this is going to make any sense. Oh, it's a seductive voice, isn't it? Oh, it is so easy to give in to that voice, to doubt what there is in yourself. Because we all, I think, to some degree, we suffer from what they call the imposter's syndrome. Somebody's gonna figure out that I'm just faking my way through everything. Because we spend our lives putting on masks for the world, putting up fronts for the world, showing bits and pieces of ourselves, but never ourselves in wholeness, and sometimes putting up masks that aren't really ourselves, but are what we want people to think about us. And so that voice of the inner critic is there to remind us that we have been wearing the masks and somebody's going to see right through you. Oh, boy. So the first time somebody does see you, not through you, but into you, into the depths of your soul, sees you for who you are, and says, I already see who you are and what you can be. The first time somebody sees that and names it, oh, can that be a frightening moment, right? My first couple of years here, in my very first ministry, straight out of seminary, were years of a lot of self-doubt for myself. Do they really know what they're doing bringing me here? Does a room full of PhDs really want this guy here talking to them about life week after week? Do they know what they signed up for? Do they know that I'm just faking my way through it? But I get up week after week and I give the sermons and I do my pastoral work. So the first time in those first two years when somebody said to me directly, I know you're going to do well, John. I trust you. I trust you. On the one hand, oh, what a soul-filling moment to hear that and be validated, and at the same time, it feels like you have been handed such a weight. It's a gift, and it's wrapped, but it's a heavy box, and it's ticking. <laughs> it might go off at any second. I've got to be very careful with what has just been handed to me. Somebody trusts me. What do I do with this? But they have said it to me because they need to trust someone. Because there is something they need deeply and because somehow through all of the imposters' masks they have seen something in me that meets that need. The truth of who I am is already a promise made to that person, whether I have spoken it or not, and they have handed that trust over to me. So who am I to refuse the, the gift? How dare I say no to that? What do I do when somebody sees that in me? You take that gift and you cradle that time bomb like it was a precious, precious child and do not drop it. Try to be the person that they see in you. As bumper sticker philosophies of life go, I like this one. I am a dog owner. I do strive to be the person my dog sees in me. Who I am is already a promise, and I have to keep it. You see, 
we're living with something of a trust deficit in this world today. There is a deep chasm of mistrust that is developing in this world. And we're seeing it play out in horrific ways these days, but it's always there to some degree or another. And the reason there is this chasm of mistrust, this deficit of trust in the world, has a lot to do with our own capacity in the positive or the negative to be able to trust in our own selves. So many times when we hear people say, I don't think I can trust that person, I don't think I can trust them, I don't trust them, what we're hearing is, I have never learned to trust myself. Because it's the self, it's the only thing we have any control over. We are living with a trust deficit and it begins with our own mistrust of our own selves and what it is within us because we have bought too deeply into all of those masks we have made for ourselves throughout our lives. And the only way to close that deficit, the only way to begin to bridge that chasm of mistrust is to learn to trust ourselves is to believe the other when they look at us and say, I see what is in you and I trust you and I know what you are capable of. It's hard work and we have to approach it with some intention, but it begins with knowing ourselves, truly knowing ourselves, sitting down in some quiet one by one Stripping away all of those masks we put on for ourselves so we can see clearly what it is someone else is seeing in us. Parker Palmer, the Quaker teacher and mystic, talks about there being a hidden wholeness that lies beneath all of that stuff inside us. And he actually engages in his uh, work at his Center for Courage and Renewal in what he calls circles of trust, and it's a means of getting back to that sense of the wholeness within you, being able to see what others see, learning to trust yourself again, sitting down with others who you trust and who see you, so you can get through those masks and know yourself again, and start to be kind to yourself again. Tell that jerk of an inner critic to just go away for a little while. No, everything I do is not terrible. No, the person in front of me is not just being polite. Yes, maybe I actually know what I'm doing just a little bit and might be good at my job and I should have a little confidence in that and maybe I am the person that someone else sees in me. Be kind to yourself, and in that kindness and that self-awareness, find that place of true power and strength within you that somebody else is seeing through into you, to find where that connects to that deep need that is being spoken in that moment of trust someone else has placed in you. and then become the trustworthy person. Make a decision about how you will lean into that power and that need and commit to it. Be the person your dog thinks you are. Take that first step out onto the water, whether there's a storm or not. Because the world needs us to. It needs us to have that trust in ourself. That trust deficit we are experiencing right now really does feel like an unbridgeable chasm. It is playing out in horrific ways in this world today. We have become so adept at making masks for ourselves to lead our own selves into mistrust that we are able to project them onto other people now, criminal terrorist, poor, unlovable, nobody. We can put those masks on other people 
And as a society, that is just what we are doing right now, to the point where even if we know in our heads and in our hearts that it is wrong, we have bought into the narrative enough to wonder if anyone can ever trust us as a people ever again. How could we possibly be a trustworthy people? How could we possibly aspire to what we aspire to or claim to be who we are as a people? How can anyone trust us to be those people with the masks that we put on others out into the world? Some of you were here yesterday afternoon and last evening to join us for the presentation of the Staging Post documentary and to meet the students from Afghanistan, the two young women who have come here, uh, part of the Hazara people of Afghanistan and Pakistan who have been brought here to study where they cannot as young women in their communities. And we got a chance to talk to them and ask them questions. And one of the first questions was, what is it like to be here in this country? And I know what my immediate assumption was, that it had to be scary, that it had to be frightening to live among a people who project so much mistrust onto the world today. I thought that's where it was going, and the answer was something else entirely. These young women here in this country where we project so much hatred and mistrust right now saying, no, I can feel the freedom. I feel what I did not have in my home. I feel welcomed. I feel unjudged. I feel like it does not matter that my skin is dark and my religion is different and that I am a woman. I feel like none of that matters. Holy cow. Right in the fields, folks. <laughs> I didn't think we were that people anymore, even though I am so fundamentally opposed to the story we are telling to the world. I didn't think that was who we are or who we could be anymore. But they can still see what is best in us. We already have what they need. And here they are saying, we are already here. We have made it halfway. Step on out of the boat and meet us in the middle. I want us to be the people they think we are. And I think we still can be those people. The trust deficit is huge, the chasm of mistrust is large, but it is not unbridgeable and it is not permanent. We are already good enough. We already have inside us what it takes to change the story. So there's a storm raging around us, so what? So there is noise. That's all it is. It is noise and it is bluster. And it is a lie. Someone has seen past who we say we are into who we can truly be, who we can be. if we can at last learn to finally and fully just trust ourselves. To be who others see. To take a step out onto the water. To be the promise we have already made. May it be so.